idea of why Indian territory was so important to this time period. In fact, why for Texans, for people in Arkansas, why was Indian territory so important? My book is uh, on the Cherokee Nation, the Cherokee Civil Warrior, Chief John Ross and the Struggle for Tribal Sovereignty. I started it out at the Civil War, but I wound up going backwards all the way to the Trail of Tears. So I start with the Cherokee interaction with some guy named Andrew Jackson. And I wind up going to his interaction with Abraham Lincoln and then Andrew Johnson after the Civil War. The same chief, John Ross, you see on the cover of the chief of the Cherokee Nation for 38 years. And so he's the same guy interacting with Andrew Jackson and with Abraham Lincoln. My connection to Prescott is to this guy. I learned many, many years ago that my grandfather was, I was always called Choctaw, but we could never find him. Long story short, my grandfather, he was born here in Prescott, turned out to be part Creek and part German. And the story I put together was my great-grandfather, the man you see there in the upper left, a guy named Eli Davis, was half Creek, half Texan. And through racism, was not allowed to live at home anymore. So he wound up living with a family of German immigrants named Niemeyer here in Prescott, and wound up marrying one of the younger daughters, a uh, lady named Mary Edna, who's the lady, my great-grandmother there on the top right. And the little girl that he's holding, got his arms around that little girl, is my grandfather. <laughs> yeah, he hated that picture because of the dress that he put him in. But, you know, if you know much about that time period, it was awful cool. And he kept them very, and so <laughs> he hated that. But that's my grandfather there. And then here's my great-grandfather, Eli Davis, a couple of his younger children. William and Myrtle. Uh, so this is this is home. I feel like I've come home. I never lived here. My grandfather, the little girl in the dress there, moved to Texas uh, years after he got married in Cherokee County, Texas, and then wound up in the Houston area about the time of World War II. And so I'm a Texan. Um, but I feel like this is home. So that's enough of me. Now, whenever I do this, I look around and I, I realize that probably not true for all of you, but I'm just going to guess for some of you, it's been a day or two since you've had a U.S. history lesson. So, what I normally do is I don't assume I always, at the age, I'm going to walk through a very quick history to kind of help you understand why Indian terror is so important. Is that all right? I, I will start at the very beginning. This is the United States. Right? That much you know. This area would be the 13th column. Those are the ones that declared independent from Great Britain in 1776. And so we know that story. Now, keep in mind, when we declared our independence, we were 13 colonies. Each of these colonies had their own history, had their own laws. They felt very independent. In fact, they declared themselves, if you read the Declaration of Independence, they say, we declare ourselves to be 13 free and independent states. The idea of building a nation was difficult for them. They had to try twice before they got what they liked. Story. And so when we secured our independence from Great Britain, Great Britain gave us extra land, the land here in the yellow. Well, who owns that land? Does Virginia own it? Does Pennsylvania own it? And so what they did is they wound up realizing they own land together. And so all of these colonies now own this land in conjunction with each other, and they didn't know what to do with it. So they First thing they did is they set out to pass some laws. And so they passed what we call the Northwest Ordinance. They said any land that the United States possesses north of the Ohio River, that's the Ohio River, north of the Ohio River, there will be no slavery ever. Now, quick history fact here that's trivia. The Ohio River runs up to here and then it stops. And so they had to draw the line from the Ohio River eastward. They got two men to survey that line. One side of the line was slavery, the other side of the line was not slavery. Anybody think you know the name of those two men? One of them was named Mason. Dixon. Dixon, yes. So the Mason-Dixon line actually is a connection from the Ohio River to the East Coast. And so that's how they know the difference. All right, so what that means is now there is no slavery north of that line north of the Ohio River or the Mason-Dixon line. But we also secured this land. So, this, what we came 
Tennessee, well, this was natural. North Carolina said, we'll take that, that's ours. Virginia said, well, that's ours, and Georgia said, that's ours. So they took it. But later, what would happen is North Carolina said, you know, we were kidding, we don't want that. We'll give it to the United States. And so, but we're going to do this. You're going to make sure that if we give this to you, then there will always be slavery here. And so the United States agreed in 1790 that slavery would be allowed south of the Empire. In Kentucky, in Tennessee, and in all of these states, slavery was allowed here by law. 1790, they voted to allow law, to allow slavery south of the Ohio, but no slavery north of the Ohio. Does anybody see a potential problem here? Yeah. Brief lesson. Okay. 1787, the Northwest Ordinance prohibited slavery north of the Ohio. This is where the test would be if this were class. Southwest Ordinance in 1790, slavery is allowed south. So the United States government decided it. It was decided, it was in stone, it was in law. Now, here's the problem. What happens here? No, they see slavery's not allowed there. Slavery is allowed there. But what about out here? This is going to be where we start fighting with each other. It's going to end in civil war. We can never agree on what to do out here. We already agreed on what to do north of the Mason-Dixon line. South of the Mason-Dixon line, we already had it in the law books. But we had nothing written about west of the Mississippi River. And in 1803, we decided that we needed this land, and France did not. We purchased Louisiana from France, and now we own all of this west of the Mississippi River. So is there going to be slavery or not? Good question. Yes, and that's exactly what they said. They always admit it's a great question, but they could never find the answer for it. And so finally, in 1819, we added Florida and Louisiana. We defined the border. But in 1820, Missouri decided they wanted to become a state. We're going to allow slavery. We're going to not allow slavery. Is this north of the Ohio River? Is it south of the Ohio River? So this is the issue. Well, so we wind up deciding. We come to what we call the Missouri Compromise, and we say, well, I'll tell you what, let's make it a slave state but we'll allow Maine to come in as a free state so we keep the number equal. And then we draw a line straight down the nation. Our slavery is allowed south of this line, but it's not allowed north of the line. Now take a look at that. How much of that land south of that line does the United States own? All of this still belongs to Spain. So the southerners are thinking, okay, this isn't fair. But it's going to get better. By the way, that line is the 3630. And then in 1836, near, near and dear to this Texas heart, Texas made by its independence, and then in 1845, Texas joined the United States. So now we have another slave state. And if you notice, Arkansas in 1836 became a slave state. For us to not be able to decide what's going to happen west of the Mississippi River, so far every one of you have been slave states. And so now the North came a little country. And so in 1850, we wind up with California. And now California are free states. So anyway, we've got this great debate going on. We call it the Compromise of 1850. But part of the compromise, we allow California as a free state. Slavery would be allowed in New Mexico. In the desert in New Mexico, we allow slavery. Now, slaves did more than just agriculture. Many of them were ranchers. Many slaves, whatever the need was. Slavery was banned in the District of Columbia, then we passed the Fugitive Slave Laws. And if I'm talking to you about the Emancipation Proclamation, you'd have to understand that. But most Southerners thought, let's keep this like this. No more compromise. California is now a free state. Iowa now is a free state. So this is where it gets interesting. 1854, we start talking about railroads. How are we going to get this railroad all the way to California where the gold is? And so they come to an agreement and they set Kansas aside. We're going to let the people of Kansas decide for themselves if they want to be a slave state or a free state. Well, in 1854, the population of Kansas was about 5,700 people. So do you remember the story? Newspaper editors in New England started writing to all the young men available, you need to get to Kansas as quickly as you can and vote against slavery. 
And then the border ruffians from Missouri rushed across the border to vote for slavery. And so, so many people moved into Kansas that by 1860, the population is now 107,000. And these people are from elsewhere, and they came simply to, to sway the vote. And many of them came armed, including this guy. Anybody recognize him? Southerners, John Brown's best work. John Brown came from Connecticut into Kansas, killed some people in Kansas, and then wound up in Virginia, Harper's Ferry, Virginia, where he seized the arsenal, was going to use it to give the guns to the area slaves and allow them to shoot their way to freedom. So Southerners did not trust anyone who was an abolitionist from Kansas. In fact, they quickly took a name. Anybody know what we call the abolitionists from Kansas? Jayhawkers. So, here's Texas. Here's Kansas. Notice what's right in the middle. Indian territory. I want you to look how close Texas is, North Texas particularly, to India, to Kansas. The capital is Austin. For many of these counties, they're closer to Kansas than they are to Austin. And so they believe that the biggest threat to them during the Civil War is going to come out of Kansas. And that's how we're going to wind up with Curdy Ann very soon. You follow? Okay? So, and there's what we call bleeding Kansas, and then I call it burning Kansas, because in Texas, in the summer of 1860, this is about seven months after John Brown's became a cuss word, there was fires in North Texas that the North Texans believed the Kansas abolitionists started. So next thing you know, there's all sorts of turmoil. Texas is lynching people. North Texans are ready to go to war. And when the Civil War starts, North Texans cannot wait to make sure that they occupy Indian territory. Because if not, the Kansans are just going to have just a straight shot right into North Texas. And they're going to do to us what they tried to do to the people in Virginia. But the, the long road to get here, do you understand kind of why Indian territory is so important to the people of North Texas? Because this whole debate over slavery now is going to center right here where the Native Americans are. So that's how I wound up here. This story from the perspective of the Confederates. And then I would read history books who talk about the perspective of the other white people in the war. But I never heard anybody that seemed to agree what the Cherokees were doing. So I wanted to make sure that I told that story. And so that's what the book is. This is the Cherokee Nation's perspective on what's going on in this time. It's a pretty fascinating story. But in Indian territory at the time, what we used to call the five civil rights tribes. Well, we at least take in the civilized out because by civilized we mean those tribes that act like white people. That's how we define that. So these are now the five tribes or the five southern tribes. But each of these tribes had treaties with the United States. So the United States decided the Native Americans didn't need any part of this war, so they went home. They went and fought somewhere else. They put the troops back to Washington and they're going to fight at Gettysburg and in Antietam and places we've heard of. The Confederates moved into Indian territory because it's between us and Kansas. And we have to be there. And so now the Confederates are the only ones there. The tribes had treaties with the United States. And the United States is now gone. And the Confederates are here. And so that's part of the dilemma I talk about in the book with Chief John Ross. And how is he going to navigate that issue? He has a treaty with the United States. But they're not here. The Confederates are here and they're now pressuring me into joining them. So he has to do what he thinks is best for his needs. And he will eventually sign a treaty with the, with the, jury, with the Confederates. Only knowing that as soon as he had the opportunity, he would return to the United States. Alright? So each of these tribes had treaties. And these treaties, you know, they're likely the Confederates were concerned that if they were friendly to the Union Army, they might help the Union Army. If they're friendly to the abolitionists, they might help the abolitionists if they tried to go to Texas. So part of the reason they're there, you don't know, I'll fly through that. February 23rd, 1861, Texans voted to secede. So when I teach Texas history, I make sure that we do this. 
February 23rd, Texans voted to secede from the Union. On February 27th, the governor sent troops to the interior. That quickly. It's the first thing they needed to do. They had to keep the abolitionists. We have to keep John Brown's other friends from coming to Texas. Okay? So the Creek Nation signed a treaty in July of 1861. The Choctaw, July. You see the pattern here. John Ralston Cherokee, and I talk about this in the book. He, he said, in May, say, I'm on my other side. I'm for the Cherokees, and we're going to adhere to our treaties with the United States. Period. Well, good. The United States is gone. The Confederates are standing next to you. The Confederates begin to pressure them and ultimately, ultimately give him an ultimatum. A guy named Albert Pike. Albert Pike is an agent to the tribes in Indian Church this time. And he's the one that interacts with John Ross. And Albert Pike's the one that talks him into finally signing a treaty with the Confederates. It's a pretty powerful moment. I spend a good part of the chapter talking about that interaction between Ross and Pike and how Pike ultimately wins out. Pike's the only one that understands the way John Ross thinks. And John Ross finds himself in a trap. And so he has to agree. Signs the treaty, becomes the Confederate. Somebody asked me earlier um, how John Ross decided to become a Confederate. The answer is simple. He wanted his people to survive the war. And the ultimatum was that you probably are not if you don't sign with us. So, the Cherokees held out for neutrality as long as possible, but it was not until October before John Ross gave in and signed the treaty. Now all five tribes are aligned with the Confederates. Okay? And so there's a fancy map that is in the book. There's a lot going on. Um, this is, uh, you, you recognize this one, Arkansas. There's Fort Smith, there's Bentonville. Right across the line from northwest Arkansas is Tahlequah. That's the capital of the Cherokee Nation, actually. Fort Park Hill there. There's Fort Gibson. The Ch this is the, the Cherokee Nation. This area here is the Choctaw Nation. This is the Chickasaw Nation. The Creek Nation is in here. All of, they all, they're all here. And now the, the Confederates have allies here. Then there's a broader map that shows Missouri and Kansas. And historians really help you understand the war from the perspective of the Native Americans. The first three battles of the Civil War in Indian Territory, as historians call them. I just want to walk you through this, okay? This is the first three battles. We'll tell you about a guy that took place November and December 1861, three battles. A guy named Pothle Yahoo. 84 year old Creek headman, they call him. He wasn't a, tr a tribal chief, he was the chief of a clan. 84 years old. And he said, I'm, This war is ridiculous, it's not ours. And so he said, I'm not joining. In fact, Apostle Hola, who actually could read and write, wrote a letter to Abraham Lincoln and said, Sir, would y'all just come back here so we can go away? And Abraham Lincoln wrote him a letter back and said, This war is not yours. So we understand it if you. Stay out. Just let us do our thing. You just stay out. So, my father always said, all right, I'll stay out. Now, the problem is, remember, the Creek government just signed a treaty with the Confederates. My father said, hold on now. This is going to be neutral. This is just one man, right? Well, within a matter of weeks, other Indians in Indian territory learned that Apothe Hola wanted to remain neutral. And so they left their homes and Within a matter of weeks, there were six to 8,000 other Indians gathered at Apothecola's farm wanting to stay out of the war. And Apothecola's war, well, wait a minute, I can't be responsible for all of it's too late now. So the Creek government, when it was just one man, wasn't concerned. Now there are six to 8,000 other Indians gathered there who are not on our side. And so if they're not for us, then obviously these six to 8,000 Indians obviously are against us. So, Guess what happened? With the help of a group of North Texans, the Creek Nation, and the Confederate soldiers out of North Texas attacked this group of six to eight thousand men, women, children, oxen, sheep, chickens, dogs, cats, grandmas, grandpas, Aunt Bessie, Uncle John. 
first one in November. So this group panicked and they left in such a hurry they left their blankets. Many of them left their extra clothes. Many of them left the cooking utensils they had. Many of them left the animals that they brought so they provide milk or eggs to the children. And they ran toward the Cherokee Nation, but they were kept caught again in the attack the second time. And this time they turned and headed for Kansas, trying to get away. And this is an emotional uh, story for me to tell, because this is how, unfortunately, this story is. Oh, remember, the stories are describing this as the first battles of the Civil War. And these, uh, these tribes, these Indians, grandmas and grandpas and children and moms and dads and dogs and cats and chickens and oxen and sheep are trying to make it to Kansas to get away from this when they're attacked a third time. And many of them are left dead on, on December in northern Oklahoma. The ones that could make it to Kansas were left no place to live. They left their blankets and clothes. Now here they are with nothing. And Apothe Hola himself, as did many of them, died of exposure in Kansas. That's if they did not hear it. Historians call these the first three battles of the Civil War. Now, I have read the reports myself from one of the Confederate colonels. Here's what he said. He said, we've defeated the enemy, and in the process we have captured 260 women, children. His words. Oxen, sheep, and meat. These weren't just chickens, they were chickens in a crate. How hard is it to capture a crazy chicken? This is the official report of the Confederate Army that historians somehow slipped up, and this is the first three battles of the Civil War. Because this isn't a battle. This is nothing more than a massacre of innocent men, women, and children. But we get so caught up in the Civil War that it's about North versus South and nothing. So what I tried to do is I tried to let the Native Americans tell me their version. I want to hear what you're saying, and they did, and they wound up telling an entire different story. John Ross will wind up in the White House visiting with Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln will promise him when this war is over, we're going to restore you back to where you should be. And so John Ross went on to his wife's family. The Cherokee Nation were preparing for life back to normal. President Lincoln wanted to take his wife to the theater one night. And when the assassin began, the president who came behind him and said, he did what? Now, you signed the treaty with the Confederacy. You were traitors. And within 30 years, we'll have the state of Oklahoma sitting on top of Cherokee land. Long story, I've shortened that into a, a horrible, it's a horrible camp. It's a horrible part of our history. And you can read about that through the book and, and tell how we get from Albert Pike visiting with John Ross, how we get to the state of Oklahoma. And it's a, it's a heartbreaking story. Now, that, that's, that's kind of the direction of the book. I'm going to stop and I'm going to talk now. I want to be the historian and I'm going to step back and go back to the perspective of the North Texans. And the North Texans were worried about this invasion. They thought the, the, the Union Army was going to come out of Kansas. Just naturally. We're very close. Indian territory is basically, by this point, empty. I mean, it's, a, it's a wasteland because of the war. The Indians are fighting with each other. It's... So they're waiting for the, the invasion. Is it going to come through the Gulf Coast? Is it going to come through Indian territory? How's it going to get here? Where's it going to come from? Well, we finally learn in the spring, about March of 1864, that the invasion of Texas is coming. And do you know where, of course you know where it came from. We're right now currently in the path of that invasion. It's called the Red River Campaign. The Union Army kicked off the Red River Campaign. Two legs. One leg coming out of South Louisiana with 40,000 troops coming out of South Louisiana. And then General Frederick Steele coming out of Little Rock with 20,000. And they're going to need a tree for 60,000 men are going to march into East Texas and invade Texas. Well, in late March of 1864, 
Uh, Frederick Steele decided to leave Little Rock. A Missouri, Arkansas guy named Marmaduke, John Marmaduke, just tried it. He's a little small, kind of a hit and run cavalry regiment, trying his best to stop this 20,000 man. All he could do is kind of attack and attack and try to slow down. Where the story is important is that Frederick Steele, in a hurry to get out so that he could meet General Banks coming from Louisiana, actually got out before his supplies did. So he had left orders for his supplies to follow the river to come up through the Washita River to, and he was going to join them in Camden. He was going to get them to continue on. Anybody know what happened? Battle of Poison Spring. It wind up the Battle of Poison Spring. But these two ships carrying their supplies, as soon as they took off, collided. One of them went to the bottom. And the other one just was crippled enough. And now Steele's gone without his supply. So that's why we might have the poison spring. And so they're coming down the road, and if you right through Arkadelphia, comes Frederick Steele, down this path, he crosses the river. He's on his way to Camden when he realizes that a group of Confederates who've been waiting on this are coming out of Indian territory. Friends from North Texas are coming out of Indian territory. They're on their way to Washington, Arkansas, because that's where they think Frederick Steele's going. And so when Frederick Steele sees them and gets to those reports, they wind up colliding in a little place called Prairie right outside of here. And the Confederates believe at that moment they're defending North Texas and Southwest Arkansas from this invasion they've been expecting since the war started. Frederick Steele's plan is I've got to defeat them now so that I can get to Camden and get my supplies and get to Shreveport before they leave me. And so he, they like this battle. If you're familiar with the story, they engage each other a couple days, but the entire time, General Steele, they meet here at Prairie de Inn, General Steele sending the backside of his troops down the road to Camden. So it's almost like a false front. The battles are raging here on Prairie de Anne, and then the Union Army is slipping toward Camden. And then when the Confederates realize they're doing it, the Confederates chase them. And one of the interesting part, this doctor that has the letters was here. He was in uh, the Battle of Prairie de, Prairie de Anne. He was in uh, Poison Spring. And he wrote about this. He wrote about Prairie de Anne. He wrote about this uh, the days following where the Union <coughs> Army was headed toward Camden. And um, the interesting thing is, there were Indian troops fighting here, two sides. You know, the Choctaw and the Chickasaw signed with the Confederacy, and they fought on the side of the Confederacy. But there was one particular unit who was also here that one day will become a book. It's a good thing I'm a young man because I got so many. Right. This is one I'm going to write. It's about a Cherokee regiment that during the Civil War actually fought on both sides. Fought for the Confederates and then as a regiment with the same leaders, the same officers, just went into the Union camp. And everybody's waiting for them. The Union Army saw them. Good, they're here. And the next thing you know, they're Union soldiers and they're marching back into Union territory. It was a fascinating story. They made that the Union to rush into southwest Arkansas to help the Yankee invasion. They wound up with Prairie de Anne just about time the battle started. Uh, you have heard the name Richard Montgomery Gano. He was a new Confederate general, one of the Confederate generals here, that on the way from here to Camden was wounded. I wrote out the letter from the doctor who treated him and said he was shot by a Cherokee Indian. Fascinating part of the story. There are Indians involved here, but um, that Cherokee, in, this is the only regiment, I, I think, I, not the only one I know of, I think it's the only one, well, most people don't know what happened, but it's the only, only unit, as a unit, who actually served on both sides during the war. And they fought here at Prairie Anne in April of 1864. Wound up going to Camden, where he learned his supplies, and now sitting at the bottom of the river. So that's when he learned there was a large stash of, I believe, bacon and corn at a place 15 or so miles west of Camden. So he sent a group of soldiers, one of those groups, guarding the, the 1,100 trained 
car, if I'm not mistaken. One of those regiments guarding them was the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry, which is absolutely, I know there's stories out there about the 54th Massachusetts, but if you look at the dates, the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry was the first African American unit to see action during the Civil War. And part of that action was heat that occurred in the They served that, they were in battle first in Indian territory, and then they came here. So you have Battle Prairie de Anne, and very little part of the story in this region were, yes, Confederates and Yankees. Or Confederates and the Confederate, the Southern boys coming out in the end when I say Yankees. <laughs> you have the North and the South. We heard those stories. We also have Native Americans. We also have the first black men to serve during the war, all took place here in Southwest Arkansas. They wind up on their way out of this road, Camden to they went out, they gathered the corn, started back down the road toward Camden when the Confederates attacked. Marmaduke and his men, the middle of the road, North Texans come flying down the hill, and they quickly, the Confederates quickly captured the train, brutalized many of the Union soldiers, many of the first Kansas soldiers were assassinated, murdered on the spot, and the Union Army turned within the next few days, took off back toward Little Rock. And just like that, the invasion of Texas didn't happen. The Penn Indian, you might, you might run across this sometime, when the Cherokees had sought the general was called a Penn Indian. Well, that's how a certain group of Indians within the Cherokee Nation identified themselves. They were very much anti-slavery. It's a Keelah society, a very small society of, of Indians who wanted to remain very traditional and they you know, what does a traditional Indian look like? You can't tell. So they wore a pin on their jacket that identified themselves. So you would know what this is like a political party. <laughs> and so they were referred to as the pin Indians. Those were the, the, the anti slavery Cherokee who wound up fighting on both sides during the war. It's a fascinating story. Abraham Lincoln made the promise to the Cherokee people. Couldn't keep his promise because he was assassinated. The United States government went about its way in the days after the war to punish the Cherokee, the Creek, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, and the Seminole because of their alliance with the Confederates. They took their land from them, they dismantled their tribal government, and as I said, within a number of years, they did this quickly while the train was coming.
some influence on him, didn't he? He had tremendous influence on him. Yeah, Albert Pike was a was a United States Indian agent with a worked with the, the Choctaw and Chickasaw tribe before the war. But because he was from Arkansas when the war started, he went with Arkansas into secession. So the Confederate government sent him in and said, you know what, you know the Indian mind pretty well. Why don't you go talk to him to become So he used that. So the other tribes, the Creek, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Seminole, the line very quickly. And he had to use his, what he knew of the, of the, Cher of the Cherokee mind and their culture and their way of thinking, he used that against John Rawls. And so I do talk about that interaction. And that's the part that historians have really missed in the past, is why John Rawls would give in. Well, Albert Pike was brilliant. He said, listen, okay, don't sign. You, want, you, want, you don't have to sign a treaty with us. But if we win the war, you're not going to get a treaty with us then. Does anybody know who won the first two battles of the Civil War at Bull Run in Virginia, and then at Wilson's Creek in Missouri? Who won the first two battles? Confederates. So now John Ross, knowing that ultimatum is out there, the Confederates went the first two battles. So now Albert Pike will say, now, if you don't sign the treaty now, they're not going to get one later. Brilliant. He knew the Cherokee line. He knew how to handle it. Yeah. And so John Ross gave in and signed because the last thing he wanted to do was be the only tribe non-Confederate left. Arkansas was now Confederate. It looked like Missouri was going to be Confederate because of the battle. The Creeks were Confederate, the Choctaws were Confederate, the Chickasaws were Confederate, the Seminoles were Confederate, and here's us. And so he realized at that point he'd better sign. Yeah. And Albert Pike, Albert Pike was, he was crafty. He knew what to do.